County. Do I have a motion to suspend the rules? So moved. Got a motion by George Lawrence to suspend the rules. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Kenny Glavin. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. The rules are suspended. Ms. Lucy, would you read the addition of the substitution? To our policy agenda, we're substituting item 4C, the resolution requesting Governor Tate Reeves to allow a change of legislative jurisdiction for the entire boundary of Keesler Air Force Base. Do I have a motion to accept the, to amend the agenda? I move ahead to Moved by George Lawrence. Second. I'll second. Seconded by Paul Tisdale. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Mr. Mayor, your report. Yeah, th thank you, thank you. Welcome everyone uh, to this council meeting. I think we were very fortunate to be where we are in the conditions and, and uh, you know, I guess the progress we're making with COVID and then the, the, bu the bullets we dodged with these few storms seem to uh, work, be working out well for us. I think it was a good exercise to, to do the things that we did and uh, we've got more left in the storm season so we're very hopeful that we can uh, move forward without any other surprises and uh, again, we have enough surprises on our plate and uh, uh, just working on the budget so we can uh, go into 21 recovering as much of the, as possible what we lost from uh, uh, the COVID experience. And uh, I don't know where Mike is, but I think that concludes my report, uh, unless I've forgotten something. Maybe spread the minutes or something. Yeah. Oh, we do have, I'm sorry, we got some folks from Seymour to kind of give us an explanation. Uh, Bobby, oh, I'm saying I didn't see you there, you're behind. Do you want us to sit Thank down? Yeah, or uh, okay, I believe they're uploading our PowerPoint for us. Okay, I'll go ahead and do our introductions real quick. I'm, I'm Mark Seymour, uh, owner of Seymour Engineering. I have with me Mr. Bobby Weaver and Mr. Steve Brooks. We are here to give uh, you guys an overview of the master dredge plan that we've recently completed and also an update on projects that are in permitting uh, as we speak. I'm gonna go ahead and let Bobby get started on the per permitting portion. Good afternoon, everyone. Mayor, Council, Good pleasure to be here. A uh, few months back, we started off on an environmental permitting project on behalf of the city to uh, secure environmental permitting for seven sites, seven sites located within the, uh, the city limits. And they're identified up there. It might be hard to see. Hopefully, you've got the little PowerPoint in front of you you can follow along with. But, uh, to date, we've performed the hydro survey, which gives us the identification of the water depths that's out there currently. We uh, performed the SAV shellfish survey to determine if there's any uh, SAVs or shellfish that might be impacted as a result of dredging. Uh, we developed the uh, proposed alignment drawings and we held a pre-application meeting with the DMR to discuss moving forward with permitting and what issues might we encounter, particularly those where we found some, uh, the submerged aquatic vegetation in these alignments. Two of them were fairly clear. The Hiller Park, which is the internal part of the park, just south of the little weir system. It's a pond, basically. It had some vegetation, but it wasn't a protective species. We were able to proceed with submitting the joint application notification for permitting. And also one at the very top, the, uh, the broadest Cedar Lake Island Bayou had no SAVs associated with it. So that one as well has been submitted and going through the regulatory review for permitting, so we're hopeful that uh, within the coming months, this will be permitted by both the DMR and the Corps of Engineers to uh, permit to go forward. We've asked for a 10-year permit, so once you have it permitted, you've got a long window to either do the project one. Secondly, if you have to do a recurring dredge project within that 10-year limit, all you have to do is provide notification, <coughs> and you can proceed with the dredge project. And uh, so that's what we submitted for those two. There were two of them that was extremely problematic, the Boshin uh, Bayous and the Savannah Place. Now, Savannah Place is also linked with Kennedy Lane Bayou. Kennedy Lane has sufficient water depths, 
below the minus five foot mean low water elevation. So it wasn't deemed necessary for dredging. But Savannah Place and the, the Beauchene uh, canals were saturated with uh, SAVs. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more in the next slide when we get to it on the issues that we encounter with the SAVs and the problems with permitting. The remaining three, which is the Cedar Lake Road Bayou, the Shady Place, we've got a combined Shady Place, Riviera View. Those are two bayous in that one general location. Riviera View had water depths at minus five and deeper, so that would not have been included in the permit. But the Shady Place had shallower areas that we needed to, to dredge. It had SAVs, so we're going to be able to proceed with permitting along with some middle of a mitigation plan that the DMR will require. The same with Linda Drive Bayou. Uh, it was saturated basically from the shoreline south into the bayou. So those three were proceeding with developing a wetland mitigation plan to submit to the DMR for approval of the permitting process. Go to the next slide, Christy. This will give a little bit more details in the SAVs. Okay, on the submerged aquatic vegetation, or SAVs for short, they've been established as an essential fish hab habitat under the Magnuson-Stevenson Act. So therefore, the regulatory agencies have to put input into determining whether or not they would permit any such activity that would impact their whereabouts in any particular bayou. The DMR had given us the, these four criteria to kind of gauge as we proceed forward what is acceptable, what would not be acceptable, what might be acceptable with mitigation. Protected species within a man-made bayou canal can be permitted with approved mitigation. That, that falls in line with Linda Drive Bayou, it falls in line with the Cedar Lake Bayou, and it falls in line with the, um, the Shady Place Bayou. They were man-made, there's vegetation, they're per permissible for permitting, but you have to mitigate the impacted wetlands. So typically it's a three to one ratio and we're in the midst of developing a mitigation plan to submit with the permitting package. Perspe protected species within a natural bayou are generally rejected for permitting. That fell in line with the Beauchene and that fell in line with um, the Savannah Place as it was a natural bayou that had vegetation within the water bottom area. They, they would not permit that particular to those two particular alignments. When you get into invasive species, invasive species within a man-made bayou or canal can be permitted under a general permit. Those are really easy to get. And then invasive species within a natural bayou may be permitted if they deem the SAVs are not essential for fish habitat. Uh, I don't know if you, about a year or so ago, there was the koi candy, it was the giant salvinus that was over in some of the bayous in Jackson County, the DMR doing some efforts to eradicate it. Those are type of species that would be invasive, that would not be encouraging to be in a waterway. So those would be easily be able to permit with permitting and take out. The, the typical, um, well, excuse me, DMR basically addresses on a case by case situation. As you submit your documentation, they review it, whatever the circumstances might be. And then you work through that in developing your plan. The typical SAVs that we encounter here along the coast that we've been involved with is the widgeon gas, the grass, and the eelgrass. And those are protected species, and uh, widgeon was found in the Cedar Lake in the Shady Place, and the eelgrass was in the Linda Drive Bayou location. So that's kind of a brief history on the uh, SAVs. What was found in the Beauchin area? Pardon? What was found in the Beauchin? Eelgrass. Okay. And it was, it was a protected species and it was in a natural bayou. So that was automatically from the DMR not permittable. The reason we were able to move forward with Cedar Lake, Linda Drive Bayou and Shady Place because they were man-made and they had the vegetation in them. And that, that's just the, uh, the determination that the DMR had. So that's our first step. I'm sorry, you got a follow-up? So are we dead in the water, no pun intended, um, with regard to the Boshin area? In my understanding from the DMR, yes. 
Okay. Can you go, Ivan? I need a question. No. Mr. Weaver, is there any consideration if there was a bayou that kind of silted in over time and kind of filled in so the sunlight and everything was able to promote the growth of the vegetation that otherwise, if it was maintained, would, would not be there? Yeah. Um, typically, these are found in the shallower waters, so where you may have two to three feet of water depth because of the sunlight being able to penetrate to the bottom, they thrive. Uh, when you get into deeper water, they don't, they don't survive. Some of these are strange. Sometimes they're, they're there this year, winter kills them off, and they don't reestablish the next year. So it can change from year to year based on the growing season, how harsh of a winter you might encounter. Those are just some of the characteristics that we've experienced over the years. So if that occurred, could we reevaluate and reassess if that vegetation is not visible if, for whatever if, reason? If we were able to determine that there were no SAVs present, then you would be able to proceed with permitting okay. in those circumstances that indicate. Thank you. Any other questions on the, the permitting SAVs? If not, I'm going to let Mark uh, give a brief on the, uh, the master dredge. Councilman Lawrence. Uh, how, how come uh, Keegan's Bayou wasn't considered in this? Okay, pardon? Keegan's Bayou. How come that wasn't not listed or even looked at? The Keegan's Bayou was included in the master dredge plan. There were 58 group of alignments in the master dredge that we performed a hydro survey and we did an alignment drawing to determine water depths and plugged it into the evaluation for the, um, the master dredge plan. But it wasn't one of the groups the city gave us initially to do the permitting as these seven sites were. Yeah, but I'm just saying that they need to be cleaned out of right. Keegan's Bayou. Yeah, now, it, it is bay. identified in the master dredge plan and also yeah, there's some work with the other Keegan. Some of these other projects that right. You mentioned and submitted, I think, for this section, this go around. Right. Okay. Uh, Bob. On the master dredge um, plan, like I said, we had 58 plus, I say, groups of sites. Some sites had a couple little side bayous off of the main alignment, so they were all lumped together. So there were 58 of those that were included. Those were selected by the, by the city. We went out and did the evaluation. Some of the items that we gave consideration on was, did the bayou have a drainage benefit? Was there a, a benefit further into the bayou that provided some conveyance relief for an up and watershed? Some had drain pipe entering it, some didn't have anything. So that, that was a component. We looked at the number of parcels that water body interacted with and the number of residents that had interaction with that water body. Uh, whether or not there was a commercial or an industrial aspect to the property that the water body reached. And then the last thing was water depths. And that was one of the ones that had more of an emphasis. You know, if we had in, in the residential sites, if we had a minus five and greater in depth, there was no need to do a dredging. Typically minus four to minus five is sufficient for recreational use. Uh, some of the harbors, which got more established, they needed to minus 12. They're baseline. Picked up how the field runs 
Does anybody have questions? Yeah, uh, Councilman Lawrence. I don't know whether it's both of you. Just what you have listed in money is four point seven million. Can we get that much money from these places? From Pima and Mima and these Thailands, man. That's about just what you have listed prices on is four point seven million dollars. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Well I, I mean you got a lot of other ones not even priced yet. So you're talking about six, seven million dollars. Is it possible we can get that much money from? A lot of things are possible, and Mark and, and, and Bobby, and we, you know, from day one, with but you know, all the projects that we, you know, regarding waterfront, we worked closely and identified <coughs> the possibilities. We hadn't really, you know, got to check yet, but I mean, we at least you we appreciate it, you know, the, uh, the opportunities that you've uh, you know brought before us to uh, make some of these things happen, especially you know, Keegan's and, and the uh, Bay View uh, uh, Boardwalk and, and Sherman and all these other ones that. Uh, are happening. There's a lot of, you know, opportunity. Uh, we haven't been very successful, you know, with regard to some of these things that we would think would be obvious, but uh, we're still plugging away. Also, we went up to Division Street. Thank you. We, we made our way north to, to Division Street and picked up all, all the debris and, and everything that's silted in and filled in that ditch uh, that causes some flooding issues for you guys. And that's almost all the Keesler floods that way. Yeah, exactly. It'll, it'll give us a lot of relief if we apply for Go Mesa money on that one. Well, I know we've been trying for uh, several years to get the Point Marina dredged out, and you got to listen to 2.7 price. I mean, you, did, you have to get $3 million okay, to get that done. Can't get half that money and try to do it. I mean, uh, we've been working up for the last few days trying to get enough money to clean yeah, up the harbor, make it red, red deep, million, get bigger a bigger boat than on Point Cadet Harbor. Yeah, we actually did a million dollars worth of dredging on the west side. Is that right? Yeah. Say again. It. So we 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 actually dredged about a million dollars worth of dredging on the west side of Point Cadet oh. Marina, and the rest of it needs to be done to whatever depth I think uh, it 
Was that done at Katrina time? Or I don't think it was totally, was it? Uh, it was <clears> at <throat> Katrina and it did again. Not that long ago. <clears throat> yeah. Um, on the west side, that's what I was talking about. Yeah. So that's, that's Jack, that's, I think, 12. I think it's the minus 12, yeah. So my, my question really was that can you get enough money to do the job and complete it? Like, the, you have 2.7 million, that's what it takes, and we have to actually get 2.7 million to do the whole harbor. Well, uh, the, whole, the whole master plan of Point Cadet include dredging was, you know, the reconfiguration in, of the, you know, uh, the the whole, I think we asked for $18 million to do all of it, right? I think. So uh, we'll keep those cards and let us go on. But yeah, it's certainly, you know, you can't have a redesigned marina without, a, you know, uh, accommodations of uh, the new types of vessels and the bigger vessels, and that's the whole idea. But it's on the radar. We don't have the money, but it's on the radar. Yeah, t typically on those larger ones, we'll just set our priorities, and we'll, you know, you may have to knock it out in a few phases, because yeah. um, those are big dollar amounts to be asking for. Thank you. Any further questions? Councilman Barrett? Um, I know that we had, and this might be directed more at Christie, I know that we had done some um, stuff right after the last tropical storm that came through on North River, Riverview Circle, and um, I don't think it was dredging. I think they just went in. Clean. And, just clean and does, this, does this plan include, uh, in more seven, we have a lot of water, but we don't have a lot of, um, of the homes, especially in that area, that are actually on the water. The water is out from the marsh in some areas, but on um, Scenic River Drive, from that same storm, I had a guy come to me the other day, and there's multiple homes along there that can't use, that you know, they had their um, boat houses and stuff, and they can't get their boats in and out because that stuff keeps, I guess it goes to the bottom, and then when the tide comes up, it comes back, which was, it was all brought in from that storm. Is that something that we can do and get reimbursed because it was caused by that storm? Okay. Okay. Does that plan include those 58 spots? Does that um, scenic river is, area, is that included in that? Okay. And I don't know how many, I don't know how many homes it's actually impacted. I just, I ran into a guy at the gym the other day and he's like, we can't even get our boat in and out since that Council tropical storm because of that. Councilman, one uh, interesting fact, I think if you have not seen it yet, the conference report coming out of the legislature on DMR has got a really interesting point they're making. They've given us a project they call Eagle Point Canal Cleanup. You remember that when that canal was what uh, is that about a hundred thousand there? No, it was only it was only forty thousand. But yeah. the point is, they've committed now to the fact that they can we can use Tideland's money for that canal. Originally, their op their, they told us it was a man-made man -made canal, it was not Tideland's, mm -hmm. and therefore they couldn't, they couldn't spend any Tideland's money on it. But well, they, spent, the legislature has just, a, it, we spent $40,000 Casey had to told me it. he was gonna work at getting that done. So, but I didn't so know they've that. just now committed to the fact that it is Tideland's. Okay, all right, good deal. All right, that's just, I, like I said, I, I know I brought the other to your attention and we went out there and did some stuff, but I didn't know that this area had the same issue you know, the guy just brought it to my attention the other day, so. Yeah, and I know we have some of those, like, um, Noel Reed is over there. I brought the best update. Well, he's on one of those two canals, that um, that Riviera view that they're talking about. He's one of the um, ones trying to get done. Yeah. We don't have the money yet, but in the next year or two, as money comes in. Okay. That area. All right. That's all. That's all I got. Okay. Mark? <laughs> Show again. Just to kind of close things out, uh, like I said earlier, if you guys have any specific areas in your wards, we'll be more than glad to meet with y'all. Um, it's about a 300-page document, so it's got every one of these canals with the depths, locations. Um, we'll be glad to give y'all more, more detail as you have time to think about it and come up with questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate all the work y'all done together and with us, and, and uh, you know I think we look forward to you know engineering the future here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before you guys.
Mike, Proceed. I think that's all I need to say. Huh? That, that, that concludes my report. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, Mike, excuse me, Christy, actually, did um, did we ever address the Patricia Place Thornton area, Thornton Drive? It's in that. It's in the maintenance plan. Okay. Already, and so it's in the queue to get permitted as we get through this. The very first slide you saw. Once we get through that round of permits, we're going to start on the next round and try to get everything as much as we can permitted. So it should be in the next round. Okay. But Thank it you. Is in there. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, you're still? No, we're done. All right, well, that will bring us to council reports. Councilman Tisdale. Uh, yeah, just a uh, reminder, I have a Ward 5 meeting scheduled for Monday, September 14th at 5.30 at Snyder Center. Um, Monday the 14th of September, 5.30 at the Snyder Center. Everybody's welcome. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Tisdale. What are what are the provisions being taken? Are there any COVID provisions being taken at that meeting? Anything to be prepared for? Social distancing and masks. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Thank Ms. you, Mr. Newman. Mr. Lawrence. Has y'all been uh, well aware we're having a lot of hurricane dancing around of us? One fell apart, which is good. That would look like it's going to go to the Houston, Louisiana, that side of the, the line, which is good for us. If it breaks where it is, you'll probably just get a little wind, some rain, which is a good thing. I went to Margaritaville the other day, and I went to the side at the ball with Kenny and ordered the Corona two hurricanes. The guy said it'd be 2020, please. <laughs> right? That's it. <laughs> Councilman Barrett. No report. Councilman Gaines. <laughs> Yeah, I got a couple of things. Um, I guess it just, um, I guess it just hit me. Um, um, we were talking about Keegan's Bayou, and I think Chris did. <laughs> I know we had some erosion issues. Uh, erosion issues. Would that be something that we can use that Tideland money to uh, handle? Absolutely. And when we do that Keegan's Bayou project that we're talking about doing, we're going to be addressing all of that. Um, that's part of everything we're going to be doing, cleaning out the sediment, reestablishing the banks, reestablishing native vegetation, cleaning out all the Katrina debris that's still in there, um, hopefully some boardwalks, some kayak launches and that kind of stuff. But yeah, okay. absolutely. And I was thinking about, um, uh, I think, I don't, I don't know if you remember about a year or two ago about, uh, I think it was seal at yes. the end of seal yep. that the guy was worried about the erosion yes. of his property. Yep. And if we can find a way to kind of repair that for him. Yep. Yep, so that's, that will be included in all of that. Yeah, yeah, so it just came to mind. I, I believe so. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty extensive project. Okay, thank you. And I don't know if this uh, is in your area. The piers, Back Bay piers? Yes. The Back Bay piers. Um, uh, either me or Larry. I don't know if Larry's here. Yeah, one of the residents asked me about the repair of some of the piers back there Okay. Uh, from the storm. Yeah, we're, we're working on that. Larry and I have been working um, to try to get quotes, and I'll touch base with Larry. We kind of, on the storm stuff, Larry and I work together on that, so I'll find out what the status of that is. Cristobal was established in FEMA uh, past, so we're going to get some reimbursement. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, and I just want to remind everyone, if you know anyone within the confines of the city of Biloxi, uh, we're doing rental assistance. And that's going to be at the uh, Gruitt Center. I still have the paper here. I'm going to put it on my Facebook page. It's also on the city page. People who are having a hard time with paying the rent due to this COVID-19, the layoffs, things like that. We have rental assistance for people who are within the, uh, uh, the, the boundaries of Biloxi to help them out. And of course, if they meet all the, um, if they meet all the qualifications, we can help them up to three months of uh, paying their rent and other bills. Uh, the other thing I uh, have is um, I want to touch bases uh, with Mayor uh, Walt, 10 o'clock Monday, answer some of the questions that we uh, discussed in our meeting earlier this week. And also with uh, Walt uh, last, uh, Oscar Rinda, I want to know uh, when they're going to get out of Lee Street Stadium. I need them out at Lee Street Stadium and when they're going to uh, clean it up and 
have it prepared for our next project. Thank you. That concludes my report. Councilman Glavin. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Director, for, for not going and sitting down. But uh, one of the questions I raised it last time, and we listen, we appreciate all of our con local contractors and engineering firms and the great work they do for us. But, uh, and they did a great job down in North Haven in some of those canals and everything. Um, but again, were you able to verify that there is a mechanism if the, uh, that we can maintain for a period of time the depth so if it does start filling back in, we can go back in and clean it out before it starts growing vegetation and we may not be able to touch it again? Yes, and that's okay. one of the things this master plan is going to do for us is that we now have evidence of how deep it was. So, so my question is, if, if we do have the ability to do that and our permits say we can do that, there has to be a little bit of mo uh, money earmarked for the maintenance of it. Otherwise, we'll be fighting it for another 20 years. I mean, it's been 20 year plus years in a lot of cases of these canals being dredged. And yes. uh, I don't know how we accomplish that, yeah. but it, yeah. it, if not, we, it's just like the ditches, they get overgrown and, right. and it takes us two decades to clean them out. It'll be the same way with these canals if we don't watch it. Yeah, and I agree. It, it has been a long time since we've done dredging. I think this maintenance plan is a step in the right direction. At least Absolutely. now we know what we need to dredge and how much money that we're gonna, it's gonna cost so we can start getting this stuff. You know, like Mike just said, that's, that's what we're trying to do is this maintenance, right? get on a routine so that we're not 20 years from now sitting right here trying to do everything all at once again. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, the other thing uh, I, I do want, my heart goes out to the Biloxi football team. Uh, I know they're in quarantine and uh, had to at least give up one football game uh, currently. And uh, we hope uh, that things get right uh, pretty quickly and they can resume you know, playing. I know they want to play. I've talked to several of the parents and, and players and it, it's just, you know, they're, they're ready to go. Um, and then on Real Men Wear Pink, uh, our campaign today went over $10,000. Uh, Jace Payne uh, was the donor, but it took everybody to get there and get over the hump. So that's really a benchmark that uh, this campaign went over. I, I do want to appreciate again, uh, First Lady Serena Gillich and uh, others in this room, including uh, council members, uh, Dr. Tisdale and uh, Nathan Barrett. I, I know a couple of you said y'all are gonna get to it. Y'all are real busy and I appreciate those donations. I'll make sure that you're recognized. I just need a good pink picture. I know Dixie has some pink, but I don't know about, and I know Robert may have some pink, but I don't know about uh, George and, and Felix, but, uh, but we'll get you some pink if, if you need it. Um, and I wanna just again tell a heartwarming story on that. We, I've been posting on, on the internet, and I've, I've told this story before, but I'm gonna tell it one more time at this meeting. I had a guy from Nashville, from Bay St. Louis, that reached out and he offered a song that he wrote. His name's Brian Austin, if you wanna Google him and look it up. He's played for several of the big name country stores, but stars, but he's performed the song itself. And, and it uh, says Brave, Brave Hero is the name of the song. And it's very touching that he would reach out, recognize it here in Little Bitty, Biloxi, Mississippi. And um, uh, we got a, a reveal happening this Thursday. It's gonna reveal the other 30 men that are contributing this year. Uh, you'll see it on Facebook. If you get a chance, go to it. And, and we appreciate your support very, very much. Um, and on that, getting away from these donors, uh, and some other things that are gonna be happen happening. My wife, well known for cook, uh, making push erratas, she's gonna do a push errata for a Real Men Wear Pink sale. So you can donate by $10, you get a sample of uh, push erratas. And the Croatian kid, my grandson, is gonna get in the mix and, and he came up with a, a thing last night. He's gonna do some pink lemonade, a Real Men Wear Pink lemonade sale, but he is starting the pitch for a nine and under travel team. And he said, Papa, what about every strike that I throw in a game, you donate $1 to real men wear pink? I said, you're on. So uh, got to go to the bank account, and I got to get some money to support the Croatian kid. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Councilman Glavin. Uh, Mike, with this Cape Seal, what do we end up spending on that? This is the paving job? Yeah. <laughs> you remember? Yeah. 
I just want to know if it was, I, I know, look, this is yeah, something I, that we're I, not going to use I, again. I, I dropped you a note into your box. And I think you probably saw it that said we're never going to do that again. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and have you talked to the contractor? Are we going to have any more assistance getting up some of the rocks? Yeah, thank you. I did get a, a message from a, a very um, faithful follower of the city council that said when she gets up and speaks, please use the microphone because it looks horrible in the video. So, I, um, I, we, we didn't get a response from um, the contractor who did the work, but we're trying to get another contractor to come out there and come clean up behind them so that we can make sure it's really good and done right. I'm sorry, I missed that last PO. part. You've got money, you can use an emergency PO and do it. We're gonna, yes, we're going to get it cleaned up. We're working on trying to find a contractor to do okay, it. Okay, so but what I need is I need coordination of the date. That way I can let the residents know to, sh to rake up the rocks that are in their yard up onto the street so they can, they can be retrieved as well. I will. I'll let you know as soon as we get it scheduled. Okay. Hopefully it'll be soon. We're trying to get a contractor who'll come in and do it for us. Okay, thank you. And I... Oscar Renda's updates on this on the um, the agenda today. I didn't see an email from them. So did they give us an update? Um. Oh, can I get a hit? No. Okay, um, Mr. Mike, Mr. Mayor, um, the bond monies. We've we've got a request to to see if we can get a um, a summary of what we have left, what it's been spent on, and where it's been spent. If you'll put together a summary for us. We, uh, we do a quarterly update, uh, we, and we're right on top of the, this quarterly update now. Okay. Well, that you've seen the spreadsheet before. Mm -hmm. I mean, it changes every day, but we try and update it quarterly. How far, it away, are we, the, how far away from that update? I would we'll watch it. like it's a calendar. I we'll have it. We'll, it'll be one of the exhibits that'll go in with the budget. Okay, so next month. Yeah, but, we can make yeah, but I mean, you're going to see it as of the end of third quarter. Because we can't do the end of fourth quarter till right. fifth to fifth quarter. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I think that's all I have for today. Um, we will move on to citizens' comments. We have 45 minutes total, three minutes per person. If there's anybody on the left-hand side of the room, my right-hand side, that would care to speak, please come to the front, state your name, sign in for us, and state your address. If there's anybody on the left or right hand side of the room, my left hand side, please come forward, state your name and address, and sign in for me. Good evening, I'm Maurice Williams. I reside on Trowler Lane in Ward 2. Williams. Hey everybody, I want to thank y'all for giving me the opportunity to come speak on this platform. Um, first, I want to say uh, I was inspired to come out and speak today because I saw the citizens from War II come out last week. And um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to be here in person. I tested positive for COVID-19 around August 3rd and I was still quarantining. But uh, I really want to use this as an opportunity to kind of speak on my background and um, what I would have said if I were here to stand up with them. Uh, so I'm, I'm from War II. I grew up on Keller Avenue. Uh, my great-grandmother helped raise me with my grandmother and my mom. Uh, she was Victoria Beck, the wife of the late, late John Henry Beck. Um, so I have a big sense of pride in our community and what we stand for. I graduated from Biloxi High School in 2016. Um, I was voted Mr. Biloxi High School, which is a small achievement on the things I plan to get done in my life. But uh, I think it speaks volumes on my character. Uh, I'm not only accepted by my peers, but they see me as someone that represents them. After that, I decided to attend the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I'll be wrapping up my studies there in the coming months. Um, I say all that to say I'm, I'm fortunate for a lot of people that come from War II. I'm a fourth generation college student. Most people can't say that, let alone most black people from Mississippi, and that's something I take pride in. Um, I'm also here to speak on what I believe are some of the bigger issues for our ward. Uh, frankly, I believe we have a disconnect with our current councilman. Um, you might have noticed that from a lot of people that came up and spoke. Um, and I don't say that to point fingers, but I say that because there's progress that needs to be done. Um, we simply don't have a lot of necessities that we need to have a comfortable living environment. Um, I feel like we need gas stations, grocery stores. Uh, I know we're in the works of starting a project for a community center, but 
you know, it's been a while. We had three or four before the hurricane, and all we have is a private community center that charges membership fees. I know we have scholarships, but that's very deterring for a lot of citizens in Ward 2 when they're asked to, you know, present things like their taxes and, and, and you know, how much they make per year. They're already insecure about things like this, and it's a deterrent rather than um, something that attracts them to come use these facilities. Um, I say all that to say, uh, I, I just know there's room for progress, and I hope we can strive to get that done. And not just the coming months, but you know, the next coming years, uh, because there, there's more that we can do. I personally stand, plan on uh, doing a lot more myself, not only back here in Biloxi for the foreseeable future. I work at the Cochrane Law Firm over on Water Street as a legal assistant, and I plan on using those that, uh, that not as um, necessarily a platform, but something that can help me educate people on the process. Uh, I know I'm running out of time, so again, I just kind of want to thank y'all for uh, giving me the platform to speak out and um, expressing my beliefs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Is there anybody else who would care to speak? There being none, we'll move to the policy agenda. Ms. Lucy, ordinance A. Ordinance to amend section 9122 pertaining to garbage collection and disposable fees. Now move it. Second. And a motion by George Lawrence, seconded by Paul Tisdale. It's a first reading, so we'll move forward to resolution B. Resolution abandoning a 15 foot drainage easement situated between lots 192 and 193 of North Haven subdivision. I'll move it. Got a motion by Kenny Glavin. Do I have a second? I'll second. second it. Got a second by George Lawrence. Mr. Glavin, you have the floor. Uh, it's simply, I mean, it, it's a little bit peculiar, but it's a drainage easement. Both property owners adjacent to each other have agreed that it's no big deal. I think uh, everybody has signed off on it. There's no adverse effects uh, from building a single family home uh, on the lot. Um, so I think we're, we're good to go. We get another home built in the North Haven area. Mr. Lawrence. I can go, Kenny. Is there any further discussion from the council? There being none, all in favor? Motion carries unanimously. We'll move to <coughs> resolution C, please. Resolution requesting Governor Tate Rees to allow a change of legislative jurisdiction for the entire boundary of Keesler Air Force Base. I move. I'll Got a second. movement by I'll George second. Lawrence. Do I have a second? I'll second second by Felix Gines. Uh, Mr. Lawrence, you have the floor. Mike, uh, or Pete Amai, y'all can explain what we're doing here, giving us the right to go into these residence areas as a police department? Mr. Bide, if you would state your name and position for the record. Yes, sir. Peter, uh, Peter A. Bide, city attorney. Uh, this is something that Keesler has been, Keesler has been working on uh, trying to coordinate certain overlaps in jurisdiction uh, and several other bases around the nation have done this to where this is the first step to ask the governor to allow uh, our police to go on to base and to have jurisdiction if the two parties get together and decide, for example, if there's a civilian who's uh, at the off-base housing, rather than going through the Keesler federal courts, that could be handled through Biloxi courts. If um, I think there's, uh, they talk about patrolling some of the areas, if there was a response at one of the off-base housing areas, Thrower Park, for example, that they could not get to in time if there was an emergency to have that ability for the police, our police to also go into these areas. Uh, that, that's one of the primary concerns. I think the, um, so it's generally to give, the U.S. Attorney has already looked at it and approved of it. Uh, the Keesler JAG office, they're in approval. Uh, we would have to ask the governor to agree to do this. Then we would sit down with Keesler and work out a memorandum of understanding is how I would think we would do to sort of put forth some scenarios to where we're not just covering all the ba off-base housing automatically, but there's a procedure to where 
they could call on us as needed. Well, do we have to add policemen to do this? I don't think so. We've talked with the chief, and it's since it's an as-needed basis that uh, we shouldn't have to add anybody. I was just saying, I thought maybe it was some kind of program between the federal government and others, but they, you know, pay for half the police, but they had eight, six, eight new policemen to the police department, but it's covered by, by federal. Once we have joint concurrent jurisdiction, that's something I think we would like to talk to them about. If, if we were having to do something at a certain rate, that we would talk to them about compensation for that. But I mean, this is sort of the first step to to making that that sort of thing happen. I think, you know, the driving factor would be calls for service. If we estimate, uh, at, you know, we, we have about 2,200 calls for service every week. If, you know, if uh, things jump one way or the other, we can ask for an accommodation. I think that's what Peter's saying. As we get some experience on what it actually is gonna do. We'll ask them what sort of calls for services do they, you know, in, the, in West Falcon, East Falcon, Thrower and all those folks, so. It's a sort of a moving target, I think, as Peter was saying. We will, uh, if it costs us, we'll ask for some, uh, you know, some consideration. All right, thank you. Councilman Gaines, you have the floor. Yeah, I'm good with it. Discussion, anyone else on the council? Councilman Tisdale? Yes, just, just to be sure, Keesler, um, their military police would still be the lead agency, so to speak. And uh, if they required assistance, under some of the circumstances you described, then the Biloxi Police Department would provide that assistance. But it's not just like uh, Biloxi's gonna be responsible for policing the, the off-base residential housing. That's still the security police's responsibility. We're just back there in, in backup mode, if you will, and providing assistance without going through all the hassles of jurisdiction. That's correct. Okay. It, I would say too, if we became sort of the right. primary uh, person to cover it, and uh, we would have to have some serious discussions about that, and we could always withdraw our position on having concurrent jurisdiction. And that would be worked out in memorandum of understanding. Yes, sir. based on what you said. Thank you. One related point is that we're already the primary on fire. So we're Me, meaning our fire department is the primary responders in those off base housing areas today. So we're really talking about police here now and not, and not fire. Cause fire, we're already there. We're still the first, we're already the first, first alarm people. So as a side note, does the base or the United States government compensate us for that? They, they do not, but I'll ask the chief. I mean, my guess is, you probably remember back when we bought that ladder truck. Did the, the, the federal government give us any money for the extra ladder truck? Yeah, um, you know we don't we don't ask Keesler for for uh, reimbursement now because they help us tremendously. We we have a great relationship with the Keesler Fire Department. We're first alarm assignment uh, when they on base off base housing. Uh, their issue is they have to. It's a little bit different than the police. They have to go around the flight line. Uh, their fire station is on the other side of the flight line, so they have to go around the flight line and respond to a call off pass road. We have units right off a of pass road, so we can respond. We normally beat them pretty regular to their off base house. Um, but the in, the issue is, you know, it's life safety for us. We, you know, we're there to 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 assist with uh, structure fires or a medical call. Um, the big thing with us, us is we call Keesler in when we have cruising the coast or, or any of these large scale events uh, that, that we hold. We normally do call Keesler to come and assist us uh, in the city. So um, we get a great uh, a benefit from it when we're short handed and, and we're we're taxed, uh, we can call Keesler. The same with the structure fire. If we have a, a, a major structure fire on the east end of town or even the west end of town as far as that goes, the first department put on standby to cover for us is Keesler Fire Department. So 
um, and it's vice versa with them. But uh, so we have a great relationship with them, and I would, I would, uh, I would argue that uh, you know I would not want to see us looking at at uh, you know charging them because the services we uh, receive from them is is much greater than what we you know we would charge them for. Mr. Chief Boning, um, I don't disagree with you at all. You know, we receive an enormous benefit just for the essence that they exist and their people come into our city and spend their money here. So there's a huge bonus there, but it's nice to hear that there's some other form of reciprocity, even if it's not financial contributions. So thank you. Yeah, well, I think the train accident was a prime example of what kind of relationship uh, uh, Kiesler has with uh, our fire department. No, it's it's a uh, it's a good uh, good mutual assistance uh, situation. You you notice Keith Miller's not in the room, but um, Major DeBecca is, and he just whispered in my ear. And I'd like to let him set, tell you what he told me. Sure thing. If you would state your name and your position for the record, please. Major Major Christie, back the police department. Um, we've had a few areas of for several years now that we have had concurrent jurisdiction. Um, Keesler's always been primary. Um, the biggest thing is there, there are certain crimes like, uh, you know, let's say a burglary with a civilian. Um, they can't prosecute, they don't have jurisdiction. Um, over juveniles, the, the, the federal laws are so uh, lenient that they can't prosecute a lot of stuff. So like a few years ago, we had a a burglary that happened both on on civilian side and on Keesler housing, but it was was their jurisdiction. They couldn't prosecute the burglar on, for their crimes, and we couldn't either because we didn't have concurrent jurisdiction at the time. So I would I would think with the MOU it would remain the same. They would be primary. They would be uh, patrolling. They would call us if needed. You know, one of those crimes that they could not prosecute or or they needed assistance because they couldn't get there in time which is what's happened in the, the other areas. Thank you. Thank you. Major, um, Mr. Mike, did you have anything further? All right, you gave me one of those, so I didn't know if that meant it's something else. Um, is there any other discussion on Resolution C? There being none, I call for the question. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. So bring us to the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Got a motion by Paul Tisdale. I'll second. Do I have a second, second. by Felix Gines? Mr. Tisdale, is there anything on the consent agenda you would like to discuss? Uh, not a thing, thank you. Councilman Gines? Nothing, I think it's all good. Mr. Lawrence? I see where we uh, done a kingfish tournament. Y'all got special things set up where a hundred people and we're gonna just help them like we normally did with all in con service, no cash, strictly stages, help them set up everything. Yeah. So, well, our cost is sunk cost. It's just uh, loaning them the uh, bleachers and the stage. Uh, we don't know their total number of boats yet, but when on these smaller tournaments, as you know, Councilman, they don't rent a lot of slips. They rent some slips, but most of the boats go back on a trailer every night. So they don't bring in a lot of, they don't bring a lot of cash in. Of course, they make good, uh, sell them. Danny, Danny Patalo sells them a lot of fuel, a little sales tax and so forth, so. No, I just think it's good that at least we're trying to keep something going, you know, bring them back for whatever can until we can open it up like we normally do. But I think it, even a smaller scale is better than nothing. So I think that's a good thing. And I noticed at the end of this uh, consent agenda, we got a shovel thing with the police department. And I'm definitely glad to vote for that. Cause I don't want to fund anybody. I like to add more people to the police department, the fire department. You know, keep our city running safe, keep law and order, and that's the people that do it. So definitely all in favor of those things for the police department. So, Councilman Barrett, do you have any items to discuss? I'm good. <coughs> Councilman Gines, Councilman Glavin. Uh, the only thing I'd like to at least discuss in this uh, forum is the two fire trucks 
if you could summarize those two lease purchases or? Long story short, the trucks were due here in September, but right. they're late being manufactured, so we're not gonna have them till for a while. And we, we didn't wanna, it was a chance to push the payment back into the next fiscal year. So that's, we basically gave them, a, agreed to a small fee for them to push that first payment back into October. We'll, we'll have those trucks late October, early November. And, and these trucks will be housed where? Where would the asset be? Station one and station five. Okay. All right. Thank you. And the other trucks will become backups. Councilwoman Newman. And I have nothing to discuss on the consent agenda. So call for the question. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Are there any... Are there any items of opposition by any of the councilmen? Councilman Tisdale, Newman, Lawrence, Glavin, Gines, Barrett, and I have none. So this will pass completely unanimously. Move to the routine agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Got a motion by Paul Tisdale, second by George Lawrence. Discussion, Mr. Tisdale? Nothing. Discussion, Mr. Lawrence? Walt, come on, get the mic, Walt, get the mic now. Don't be talking back there. Nobody can hear you back there. Thank you, Mayor. Walt Ray Road, City of Biloxi, Infrastructure Program Manager. Thank you. There's no money yet in the pipeline, but they are working on that uh, $1.33 million we discussed at the last week's council meeting. Uh, council passed addendums to uh, two of our asphalt contractors and they're in the process of reimbursing that and that'll be an additional 605000 to the city as part of that $1.33. That's a, that was a three things we added on? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, sir. So y'all working on that? Y'all meet every week about that? We, uh, we met with MEMA on Thursday, gave them the addendums and um, they're processing it for pay, uh, reimbursement. So it's looking pretty good for the city. Very good. You said it'd be added funds, that's good. Yeah, we're well ahead. I appreciate that. 60 days. <clears throat> 60 days. Any further discussion on the routine agenda? There being none, I call for the question. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Motion to Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. I've got a motion by George Lawrence, seconded by Paul Tisdale. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. We are adjourned.